Yes, shalom everyone. This is Amir Tsarfati and I'm live from Galilee, from Israel. And this is a special Middle East update in light of recent event of the last few hours in Israel. And of course, events that are also happening all around the world when it comes to Ukraine, breaking news when it comes to Iran, breaking news and elsewhere all around the world. So why don't I start with a prayer and then we'll dive right into this update. Father, I thank you so much that you are in full control. Lord, we, we look at things around us. Sometimes it seems like uh, everything is in chaos. But uh, your word promised us that as we approach the very end, we are going to see people that are lovers of themselves. We're going to see apostasy all around us. We're going to see wars and rumors of wars. There's really not too many good things that describe the, uh, these days besides one, which is the blessed hope that we, the believers, your followers, have in your soon return to take us. So we thank you and we bless you. We ask that today you will preside over the content, tech, the technical part, and uh, may you bless and comfort every heart of every listener uh, today, we thank you in the name of the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Again, shalom everyone. This is Amir Tsarfati. I'm live from our office here in Galilee in Israel. And unfortunately, this morning, the residents of Jerusalem um, woke up um, to a very, very bad reality. Two bombs uh, went off in two different bus stops, one on the major highway that leads out of the city towards the west. And right there, there is an area where it's a bus stop, lots of hitchhikers as well. And it's predominantly uh, ultra-Orthodox kids that are on their way to their yeshivas, to their schools. And the other one was less than a couple miles away from there in another residential Jewish community uh, with the, the majority of Orthodox Jews, and which is exactly what the target was, attacking Jewish people for being Jews. Um, in fact, I do have, um, I believe, some videos. Uh, let's see. Not this one, unfortunately. Uh, I'm, okay, so I'll, I'll probably show you uh, what, uh, what was there at, seconds after the blast. Well, apparently there were uh, Palestinian terrorists that uh, left bicycles that were booby-trapped right next to each and every one of those bus stops. So it won't really raise any suspicion. Uh, in fact, that's what's left from the bicycle. Take a look at this. The explosive uh, in both cases was uh, not only uh, the explosive itself, but full of sharpnels, and which is exactly the cause of death of at least one yeshiva boy, 16-year-old Canadian citizen, Jewish boy that came to study Torah here near Jerusalem. Uh, two American citizens also among the wounded people. I'm talking about not tourists. This is not anywhere close to tourist area. This is Orthodox Jews who... Uh, came from either America or Canada and study here. They live here. Uh, unfortunately, this 16-year-old, um, I mean, it's a very sad picture that I'm about to show you. That's what he looked like a few days ago on the left, and that's what he looked like before he was buried. Um, as you can see, a young boy, 16-year-old, uh, he was brutally murdered today, and uh, on the right-hand side, that's his dead body wrapped with a prayer shawl on the way to his funeral, which was already held here in Jerusalem. Terrible, terrible morning. That was not the only thing that happened, um, believe it or not, but last night, a, an Israeli citizen, a Druze 
uh, this of Druze descent. Druze is a sect that uh, branched out of Islam in the 11th century. They live in northern Israel on Mount Carmel and in Upper Galilee. This case is from Mount Carmel, from Dalyat el Carmel. A 17-year-old with uh, another friend, they entered into the Palestinian uh, city of Jenin. Uh, there was a, a, a terrible car accident that he was involved in, and uh, he was hospitalized. His parents, his uncles, everybody rushed to the Janine Hospital where he was actually attached to um, life support. Um, and believe it or not, when the word went out to the Palestinians around that there was an Israeli citizen, although he's an Arab-speaking Druze, when the word went out that that's um, one of the other side, 30 armed people stormed into the hospital, disconnected him from the life support, basically killed him, and then kidnapped his body. And up until now, the attempt to return his body back to his parents, the Druze people who lives up in Mount Carmel, are um, failed, basically. And if, no if nothing is going to happen, a major military operation will go um, will will be underway as of tonight. The chief of staff of the Israeli military cut short his visit to the United States, and I'll, I'll tell you in a few seconds why he's there. That's another story. And he's coming, uh, he's coming to uh, uh, back to Israel 24 hours earlier than expected in order to be here and probably command over the search and rescue operation of, of a dead body of an Israeli citizen, basically. But um, also the investigation of trying to find out who are the terrorists that put those two explosives that were, by, by the way, operated remotely by a cell phone. And this uh, investigation is right now under um, um, the, uh, a court order and not to uh, disclose any information. So we cannot really talk about it right now. But what I can tell you, there is a lot of stress. Uh, and, and the reason is this, folks. We're still having the old government, the government of change, that it can do and uh, can do nothing and is doing nothing. And um, the Israelis are very, very angry because they voted for another government which is not yet formed. Therefore, it's not yet in power. So we're still suffering the complacency and the uh, inability to deal with terrorism and, and with our enemies. And, and this is still the government of change. Now, you're probably asking yourself, wait a minute, November 1st were your elections. Uh, how come you don't have a government? Well, in Israel, a week after the elections, after we certified all the results, the president of Israel is summoning to his uh, residence in Jerusalem the person he wants to um, uh, give the mandate to form the government. So on November 8, Netanyahu came and received the mandate to form a government. And from that point on, he has by law 28 days to try and form a government. Now, Israel is a parliamentary democracy. We have 120 seats in the government. You need to have at least 61 to have a majority. Netanyahu is 64. But his Likud party is only 32. He's, he needs three more political parties to form this 64 coalition. So sitting with the partners, uh, with your future coalition members, and deciding who gets what, who gets the defense secretary, who gets the uh, state department, who gets the, uh, the uh, finances, who gets this and who gets that, this is very tiring and exhausting. And apparently they really want to make a big difference. And so they want to make sure everything is written and everything is set in stone. And, and that is exactly why they, it looks like they are dragging their feet. But hopefully these recent events will cause them all to come together and eventually to form the government next week so we can finally evacuate these terrible incompetent ministers that are sitting right now in offices and put the real right, uh, the right people who can handle terrorism in a much tougher way. And so this is the situation, the political situation right now. The negotiations to form a government are on high speed. And we hope that by next week, 
a government, a new government is going to be uh, presented uh, to the Knesset, to the parliament, and it will be voted in. And of course, um, the ministers will take their seats and start working. Um, so that, that was an update about the bombing in Jerusalem and the situation with the kidnapped body of an Israeli citizen in the Palestinian territories. But there's much more that happened today. Um, look, I've been, I've been telling you forever to follow me on Telegram because I, I may not be on camera a lot because of my, my traveling <clears throat> as well as Israel tours that we're hosting lately, finally, thankfully. Um, but um, Telegram is where I'm updating you all the time. And you know, and I know that ever since the, the uh, President Putin um, finally put a, 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 um, a Russian general to command uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, things uh, started going in a different way. And what do I mean? General uh, Sorovkin, the, 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 the general that was uh, appointed to be the, the, uh, the commander, um, he basically was commanding the forces, the Russian forces in Syria. And he's doing now in Ukraine what he did to the rebels in Syria. He is not attacking soldiers. He is not sacrificing his soldiers' life. What he does, he's attacking critical infrastructures, of the civilians, and by doing so, he is basically paralyzing a country. Let me show you what happened today in Kiev, just Kiev alone, and I'm talking about 14 different cities were attacked today by a massive cruise missiles attack that the Russians uh, sent. That's, uh, look at this. <laughs> Okay, so you're probably asking what happened there. Out of the 31 rockets or missiles that were about to hit Kiev, 20, 21 were shut down, but 10 hit critical, critical infrastructure uh, uh, facilities of electricity. And almost all of Kiev is not having right now neither electricity nor running water because the pumps are operated by electricity and there is no electricity now. So running water and heating and all of that when the, it's below zero now, Celsius, centigrade. So we're talking about freezing temperatures. We're talking about no running water, no heating. And all of that caused the mayor of Kiev to say today the following thing. And I'm, I'm actually reading from my Telegram channel because, again, I reported all of that today on Telegram. And, uh, so the mayor of Kiev said the following thing to the Bild um, new, uh, German newspaper, okay? Look what he said. He said the following thing. He said, um, this is going to be, um, this is going to be, um, here it is. He said, um, following today's massive missile attack, um, by the way, not only uh, not only that uh, Ukraine got hit, but also Moldova got hit, and they have also problems. But that's what he said. We may have to evacuate parts of Kiev, of the city. Kiev may be on its way to the worst winter since World War II. He said, this is the worst case scenario. Look. 14 cities got hit today. Kiev, Kharkov, Dnieperovsk, Lviv, Kirovirog, Rovno, Lutsk, Nikolaev, Odessa, Sumy, Poltava, Mirgorod, Hemlinsky, and Zitomir. All nuclear power plants that were in control of Ukraine are being shut down. Folks, they're freezing to death. Uh, that's all I can say. And, and uh, that's what we're dealing with right now. That's something that the world fails to understand. You know, I, I don't understand that. And, and the funny thing is, right now, right now, as we speak, there is the World Cup in Qatar. Listen to this lunacy. And uh, 
teams from all around the world are playing soccer over there. And when the German team went on the, the, uh, the grass uh, to, to start the game, look what they did. Watch this. They took a photo of themselves blocking their mouth with their hands. You're probably asking yourself, why did they do that? Because originally they were about to wear an armband with the gay uh, flag. And since FIFA, the, the, the football association, told them that if they do that, they will be punished, they did this thing as if their, their mouth is being shut, as if they are not able to say what they want to say. You know, across from Qatar, dozens of Iranians are being massacred every day by the Ayatollahs. In Ukraine, people are freezing to death. In Brazil, this unbelievable election Supreme Court is threatening to take the children from anyone that goes to demonstrate against the rigged elections over there, take their children from their homes. And what the German team had to show solidarity with is the most, the loudest and the most privileged, my, not even minority group of people uh, on planet Earth right now. And Germany is a superpower when it comes to soccer, and they lost today to Japan, 2-1. They lost today. And I'm telling you, all these crazy progressive liberal mindset, it, it will always, always go down the drains. But look at the spirit of this world today. And I've been warning that the Qatar World Cup is not just about soccer. The Qataris invited a world-renowned Muslim preacher from India, who's, by the way, accused for money laundering and many other things. And they brought him all the way to Qatar to preach to the non-Muslims, Islam, and convince them. Everywhere, football fans are touring in Qatar. As they enter mosques, they're being preached to convert to Islam. In fact, I have, I have something to show you right now so you can understand what I am actually talking about. Take a look at this one. No, this is not the one. Um, let me see if maybe this is the one. That's in Kiev. All right. Okay, here it is. Witness. I do. Witness. I do witness. I do witness. That there is none. That there is none. Worthy of worship. Worthy of worship, but Allah. but Allah. I witness that there is none worthy of worship but Allah. These are Catholics coming from South America. And they enter into mosques and are being converted to Islam, basically. I have more videos of different people. And, and it's even longer than this. But I want to ask you a question. If the Football Association would have held FIFA World Cup in a Christian nation and a world-renowned preacher would have been invited to teach all around everyone, and as they walk into churches, they would have been led to pray the sinner's prayer and say and admit and confess that there is no other way, truth or life, but to God, but through Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. No one can get to the Father but through. If they would have had to say that, the world would have gone crazy. All hell would have broken, broken loose. You, you know that what I'm saying is right. You know that. And yet, the whole world, all the liberals, all the lunatic progressives, all the people that are so anti-religion, they're so anti-religious, uh, uh, you know, um, um, I guess, uh, you know, uh, spirit and all that. All these people that come against God, come ag when it comes to Qatar, Islam, to Allah, they have no problem seeing Catholics converted to Islam by the dozens.
And this is just the beginning. Qatar World Cup just began a couple of days ago. It'll be nearly three weeks, I think, or maybe more. Every day, more and more and more are going to convert to Islam under the open eyes of the whole world, and nobody says a thing. So the lunacy of advocating for the LGBTQ because the Qataris are not allowing that, and yet staying quiet when the Qataris are doing what they do the best, converting people to Islam. Unbelievable. That's what we're witnessing right now. Now, I'm going to say one more thing about what's going on in Iran. First of all, last night, an Iranian uh, officer in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard was uh, killed in Damascus with a bomb. And apparently this guy, this guy was actually um, busy um, helping the, um, helping the, um, you know, the Syrians uh, receiving weapons from Iran and of course transferring them later on to uh, the hands of Hezbollah. Um, his name, that guy's name, is Daoud Jafri. Let me show you what he looks like and also what his car looked like today. Daoud Jafri, Air Force officer in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, that's what he ca his car looked like today. Apparently, the guy is no longer with us, and the Iranians are pointing their finger at Israel. Now, in Iran, over nearly 70 days of Iranian protests. Look, it, it has never happened before. Sometimes protests would last a day, sometimes two days, three. I think the longest was 10 days. We are witnessing nearly 70 days, and it's not getting more and more mellow. It's actually intensifying. And what the Iranians are doing right now I try, I have tons of videos. Unfortunately, I do not want you to watch them. They're hard to watch. But the, especially the Kurdish community in some of the towns in the Iranian Kurdistan, they're being massacred, massacred. They shoot them in their head, shoot them all in their upper body, live ammo, and they shoot kids, they shoot women, they shoot, I mean, they understand that it's serious. The Iranian Ayatollahs never had anything like that before. Now, let me try and explain to you why the Israeli chief of staff is in America right now. Finally, the Biden administration understand that Iran has a nuclear program, that Iran fooled the whole world. Iran admitted this week that they are already enriching uranium to 60%. Let me, let me make it clear. Originally, they were allowed to enrich uranium to 2.3%. That's it. If you have, you know, civilian program for nuclear energy, that's all you need. We know that they, they did more. They did it more for 20%, from 20%, 60%. And now they have enough 60% that within days of enrichment in their newly installed third generation centrifuges, they can get within days 90% enriched uranium, which is what is needed for the bomb. For the first time since we began following the Iranian thing, for the first time, um, the Israeli head of the military intelligence on camera admitted that Iran has enough uranium for four bombs. For the first time, the, I, the International Atomic Energy Agency said that they now admit that Iran has nuclear program and they understand that they are enriching uh, uranium for a... A much higher grade. When I, with Steve, when both of us wrote this book, By Way of Deception, that's exactly what we described. 
Now, I'm not a prophet. I come from a nonprofit organization. I always tell people everything that is being said today by the chief of the Israeli uh, Israeli intelligence, by what's going, whoever is in America right now, is written in this book. And we wrote it months ago. And 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 not because it's because the writing was on the wall. Anyone who is in the inside knew all of these things, but everybody chose to put their head in the sand. They have enough. They want not just a bomb. They want a bomb to be advanced as, as close as possible to Israel so they can use it in a more effective way. Ladies and gentlemen, these are real things. Now, why is the Israeli chief of staff is in America right now? Finally, as I said, the Biden administration understand that they've been fooled. And finally, America is considering having a joint military drill with Israel, assimilating an attack on Iran's nuclear sites and on Iran's proxies so it won't operate them against us when we destroy their sites. Up until now, we were all on our own. Up until now, every time we mentioned that, the Americans were actually against it. Of course, I'm talking about during this administration. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest challenges of Prime Minister-elect Netanyahu will be to destroy the nuclear program of Iran. He knows that. America knows that. The Iranians know that. Everyone knows that. Now that the cat came out of the, the bag and now that everyone knows and that Iran itself admitted that it has enough and that it is enriching to a level of military grade, now the Saudis might be persuaded to actually take the side of Israel and maybe normalize relations with Israel. In fact, one of Netanyahu's main focus on the international policy and level is to have peace with the Saudis. And that could be the trigger, ladies and gentlemen. And so we are on the cusp of a major strike. Look, um, to tell you that we're ready, we're ready. To tell you that we're ready to do it with the American, no, we're ready to do it alone. We're ready to do it alone. All we need from the Americans is that, that they will not stand on our way to do it. And I think that this may have been the reason for the visit of the Israeli chief of staff in uh, Washington right now. And so I wanted to update you about that. The situation in the Ukraine is critical. The situation with Iran's nuclear program is critical. The situation in the streets of Iran is critical. And even in Brazil, I want to commend the strong and brave freedom fighters that are not going to stand down and to allow rigged elections of a criminal and a cartel that took him out of prison in order to run him as president and bring them down as Venezuela is today. I hope and pray that they will succeed, but I'm just telling you, we all need to pray for them because they are standing against powers and principalities that are just demonic. I, I want to, again, tell you folks that um, th there's so much that is, uh, you know, going on around the world. Sick people will always be sick people. And uh, when the news about the Israeli bombing uh, and the death of the Israeli teenager came around, guess what happened? The Palestinians started giving candies to everyone in the street. I've got more pictures of that, but it's disgusting. Sick people with sick spirit that are valuing death, cheering up for death rather than life. And that's very sad. And I want to conclude with this. Believe it or not, but the midterms in America are not over yet. There's still, I think, three more seats in Congress, in, uh, in, uh, in the House, and one awaiting a runoff in, in uh, the Senate. But the ones that are not yet decided, I want to tell you something. Before the overturning of Roe versus Wade uh, by the Supreme Court took place, everybody talked about 
not a red wave, but a red tsunami. Everyone in America were fed up, fed up with the economy, fed up with the security, fed up with the borders, fed up with lawlessness, fed up with everything. Everyone. The minute, listen to me, the minute they heard that the holy grail of allowing me to kill a baby because I want to live the way I want, the minute they realized that that might actually be allowed to be interpreted individually and independently by each state, and it's not a constitutional thing to prohibit, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to actually deal with the abortion law. The minute they realized that maybe I will not be free to have sex with whoever I want, whenever I want, and not care about the consequences there, immediately everything changed. And the overturning of Roe versus Wade not only stopped the tsunami, but made even the wave not happening. Not only that the Democrats are so obsessed with abortions, most of the independents are, and a big portion of the Republicans, believe it or not, even people who call themselves Christians, when it comes to abortion, they, they have their own thing. So it's easy to go against, uh, you know, some Islamic uh, people that are uh, cheering up when somebody is dead. And it's easy to say that they, they, they value death over life. But anyone, anyone that calls a baby in the womb of a mother, not human and not a person, and it's okay to kill it, I believe, values death over life. And this is serious, what I'm saying, and I'm probably going to be somehow punished by social media. That's why maybe you can share right now as much as you can. But I can tell you, folks, this is sickening. It's sick how we came all the way to the point from being so excited and going to the doctor with your spouse to, to hear the heartbeats and to call it a baby and to be excited. We went all the way from this to how do we kill it as late as possible? How do we get rid of it? Unbelievable. And so here we are. We're living in a world. The love of many is growing cold. Apostasy is everywhere. People are lovers of themselves. They don't care if there's another human being inside them. Let me kill it because I want to do whatever I want, however I want, whenever I want. People are lovers of themselves. Now, it's very easy to fall into depression. It's very easy to fall into anxiety, into sadness, but I want to remind you that we have the blessed hope, a great hope of the soon return of Jesus to take us. In fact, that's our only hope in this world. This world, Jesus himself said, in this world you will have tribulation. It's not going to be a wonderful world that is going to love you. In fact, if the world loves you, you're in trouble. But be of good cheer, he said, for I have overcome this world. He is coming to take us very soon. And I will conclude with this. The minute the midterm elections results came out and I saw the, the sickness and the depravity of, of so many people, it was in America, but of course, this thing could have happened any, anywhere in Europe and other places around the world. When, whenever I saw that, I wrote something and I think I posted it everywhere. I said, the next thing that is going to happen now, that they got what they wanted. We're going to see Satan attacking the church from within. And the first thing that is going to be attacked is the pre-tribulation rapture teaching. That hope that we have, that blessed hope that we have, is going to be attacked right now from within. The enemy wants, after, when we see everything around us so bad and we hold on to the soon rapture of the church, the enemy wants to take that hope from you as well. And he's using his minions from within the church to tell you, don't believe that. 
you're going to go through the tribulation. You know, I'm thinking anyone that thinks that the church will go through the tribulation probably does not understand the book of Revelation. If the church almost fell apart over COVID, which is just a tiny virus, can you imagine what's going to happen during the first month of the tribulation? Have you even considered what the tribulation is going to be like? This is exactly why we wrote Revealing Revelation. So you understand the severity, the magnitude of that which the world is going to go through. This is not going to be... In, in order for the world to worship someone as almost God, the world needs to be in such a terrible state. Not a virus, trust me. It's much more than this. Look, we're soon out of here. People write me. Do you think the rapture will be before or after Ezekiel where I said, look, the rapture is the only thing that has no timestamp because it is imminent. It can happen now. It's the tribulation that cannot start before the rising of the Antichrist. It's the rising of the Antichrist that cannot start before the removal of the church. But the removal of the church, the rapture, can happen tomorrow. And the rise of the Antichrist may happen the day after tomorrow or two years after that. Who knows? We know one thing. He cannot be revealed until the restrainer is taken out of his way. And with a seven-year tribulation cannot begin before the man of sin starts and cut a peace deal or a covenant with Israel. So all of that can only comfort you if you know your Bible, if you know scriptures. And I'm not going to stand and debate with post-trib rapture people who are out there. To I'm here to tell you, study your Bible, study the Hebrew, study the Greek, and see what Daniel wrote about the tribulation. It's the wrath from the beginning to the end. What Paul wrote using the same Greek word that was translated from the book of Daniel about it. What the Greek says about Revelation uh, 3 verse 10 what the Greek says about 1st Thessalonians chapter 1 it's not through it is from the hour of trial that is going to take us so I want to encourage all of you folks encourage you the next thing that Satan wants to do with all the things that are happening around us is to bring you down in your spirit steal from you that not only joy of salvation but a hope the blessed hope of the soon return of Jesus. You're leading someone to Christ. What are you telling him? Hey, Jesus is coming in about seven years. What are you going to tell him? Where in the Bible Jesus said, Behold, I'm coming in not less than seven years. My Bible says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. My Bible, my Bible does not give a time stamp to the return of Jesus. We know there is a time stamp for the length of the tribulation, a time stamp for so many things. But for the rapture, there is none. And this is exactly why Paul was sure it's going to happen in his lifetime. And that is exactly why all of us must live life as if it is going to happen in our lifetime, perhaps today. Father, I thank you for your word. Yes, things are so dark, so terrible, but we have your promises. We have the blessed hope. And I pray, Father, that anyone who is watching it right now will be secured in it, safe and secure in it, and will not be falling into this trap of you know, thinking that you destined the church to your wrath, which is not true. I thank you and I bless you. We pray for the Ukrainian people right now that are freezing over there. We pray for the Iranian people that are massacred by their crazy demon-possessed ayatollahs. We pray also, Father, for the Brazilian people that you will give them strength and, and, and a lot of courage to continue and fight. We pray, Father, that the lunacy of this progressive world will always hit a wall and shattered to pieces. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. And let me conclude with the ironic blessing. 
יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונך, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you his peace, his shalom. Let me show you how you can join our Telegram channel and you must do that if you want to stay updated with news. That's my only way to give you 24-7 news, videos, photos, text, and even audio messages. Thank you, God bless you, and shalom. Join the Amir Sarfari and Behold Israel channel on Telegram. Here you will receive daily updates and audio messages from Amir. You can also take part in our community and reply with comments. Getting started is easy. Simply download Telegram from the App Store, then visit the Behold Israel Telegram channel in your browser. From there, click Preview Channel, then click Join. That's it. See you on Telegram.